Hello, uh, my name is Ronnie Hernandez, uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, using the EDI covariance open data uh, platform uh, uh, environment and the R programming language to estimate a real evapotranspiration in the tropical dry forest. Okay, so first of all, what is evapotranspiration? Evapotranspiration is the phenomena where uh, we have the sum up of evaporation uh, of the water from uh, surfaces of the forest and also the phenomena of transpiration that it is a physiological process from plants. And this is, uh, the, the transpiration is a physiological phenomena where plants uh, need to take a CO2 from the, from the air. So they have these structures on their leaf and they, they are called estomata. And when they need to take uh, CO2 from, from the air, uh, they open the estomata. And so they can capture the, the, the molecule of CO2. But when they open their estomata, uh, they have, they release a water from their, uh, from their leaf. And so there is a trade off between uh, taking CO2 from the atmosphere and trying to not get dry or a lot of release of water. <clears throat> and so the relation between the amount of water transpired per unit of carbon fixed, it is called water use efficiency. And it depends on temperature, light, air humidity, and water soil availability. And these are environmental variables, but also uh, it depends on intrinsic variables like estomatal conductance and the humidity of the interior air of the leaf. So if plants have a lot of water and the air is with pretty low humidity, they are going to lose uh, a lot of water per unit of carbon uh, fixed. So plants physiologically try to, to regulate this process, but if we can uh, measure evapotranspiration, we can check the the physiological status of, of the forest. One technique to measure uh, the fluxes from the forest, it is called eddy covariance. And it has gained popularity the, the last decade because it's a methodology that allows to, to collect large amounts of data in an automatic way. Like for example, uh, exchange of heat, water vapor, carbon dioxide, and other ga gases between the, the surface of the ecosystem and the low part of the atmosphere. And you can have like um, pretty big uh, and detailed spatial and temporal scale resolution. So we can have data, if you have a project that have been measuring that place for 10 years, you are going to have a long temporal scale. And also you are going to measure a really big spatial scale compared with other techniques that are like more focused on individuals. With the data from the AD covariance, uh, we can detect changes in the ecosystem metabolism. So we can detect uh, if the forest is uh, fixing more carbon dioxide or if it is releasing more water to the lower part of the atmosphere. And because we are measuring that flux interchange, we are measuring also uh, environmental variables as temperature, humidity, and things like that. So we can relate those environmental variables with the metabolism of the ecosystem and how the ecosystem can respond to these changes in the environment.
And we can also uh, include like other technologies, uh, like for, for referring points for modeling. And these other technologies can be like satellite remote sensing. So we can com compare data points from, from, from different scales. One of the things that happens with this technique is that most of the measurement sites are located in the northern hemisphere, <clears throat> like for example, Europe and Canada and the United States of America, or places like Australia and New Zealand. But there are also there are no many places in the in the tropics, and especially in a ecosystem like the tropical dry forest. So with the Santa Rosa National Park Environmental Monitoring Super Site in Guanacaste, Costa Rica, we have the opportunity to study a pretty unique ecosystem like the tropical dry forest and see what is happening over there and what changes in that metabolism uh, are happening because of changes in environmental conditions. Now, if we have lots of data from these measurement sites and we have papers, we also have one problem. And it is not a problem just from this field. It is a problem that it is from the, the, the system of publication in, in science where we have a lack of reproducibility. So when you read a, a scientific paper, you can go through the introduction and the methods and the results. But in many cases, you will not find how they calculate uh, and how do they create their models because you don't have access to that information. And also you don't have access to the data if you want to replicate the results. But this is changing with some tools that are gaining popularity. And for example, like the R programming language that is uh, open source and, in, and it is free. So we have a big community behind working on tools for working with the data. And we have, for example, the, the, the R a, the Eddy for R or the Big Leaf R package that are tools specifically designed to work with data from Eddy covariance technique. And with this, we can have code where we can record all the steps, all the instructions, and we can share this code. And, and this can be part of the, the solution to this lack of reproducibility that science is suffering nowadays. Also with open data platforms, you can share more easily uh, the data. So what did I do over here? Okay. The site is in Guanacaste, Costa Rica, and there are uh, two towers measuring the uh, fluxes in this environmental monitoring super site. This is a tropical dry forest. And also it is a secondary forest. The instrumentation over there uh, is, well, the, the, the ethic variance, we have uh, our measurements uh, and sensors for temperature, for humidity, and, and also uh, the Iridium satellite connection. With the topic of reproducibility, we have uh, Environet on one side, where you can have access to the data from these towers for, 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 this, uh, for this work. And you can download the data. And you can analyze that data in your computer with R, but something that we see pretty often is that uh, 
with with the spreadsheets uh, we or people tend to man, uh, to, to to wrangle the data inside the spreadsheet but when you are clicking and pointing and cutting and pasting in a spreadsheet you are losing the steps that you cannot document so instead of doing this we did all the workflow avoiding to touch the raw data that it was in a spreadsheet and we wrangle and tidy all the data with the R programming language so we have a documentation of all the steps that we took to clean the data to put it in a tidy format and also all the steps to do the exploratory data analysis and also the calculation of evapotranspiration uh, from these tropical dry forests. Also, also we, we use the control version system, Git, coupled with the GitHub platform to, to, to put all our code over there in an organized way. And we want to do this because at the end, we want to have a data product. Uh, it can be a, a document in R Markdown. It can be a, a set of functions to, to deal with this specific data from the environment, or it can be a, 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 a data application. What we follow is the idea uh, that, that is published in the R for Data Science book, uh, where we import, tidy, and transfer, transform all the data in order to visualize, calculate, and model uh, the, the, everything that we needed, in this case, evapotranspiration. And at the end, to be able to communicate not just the results, but all the steps behind to, to get to those results. So uh, all the code is hosted on, on GitHub and it has uh, all, all the commits and the, and the control version and all the data wrangling and all the uh, transformation of variables, it's done with the, with the R programming language. So people can be able to, to repeat all the process from the step number one to, to the last step, that is the, the calculation and the publication in, in Armour Done. Uh, these are the, the, the conceptual steps that we follow to calculate evapotranspiration from this tropical dry forest in a reproducibility, in a reproducible manner. So we uh, downloaded the data from the Environet Open Data Platform. The first step was to create data dictionaries where we map all the, uh, all the variables in the data sets and we describe them uh, as they come out, like the raw data with all the missing values, with all the old layers, with all their distributions and their definitions. With that first step done, we continue uh, to, wor to work on the exploratory data analysis to see uh, if we could be able to calculate evapotranspiration. So this step we consider that is a quality assessment of the data, the restrictions that uh, that data represents to, to get to the objective of calculate evapotranspirations and the assumptions that we have to, to, to take. And the second step was the, the process to estimate uh, evapotranspiration. So we evaluated uh, our packages. We end up uh, using the big leaf R package. And we did some data wrangling and some data feature engineering and we also evaluate some eddy covariance data treatment techniques to to clean the data and have everything in, in order 
uh, the last step that is for a next step after this is to organize all this work in a data product to estimate and retrieve evapotranspiration automatically. And for that, we will need to develop and testing the, the, the data product. But as a first step, we were able to, to calculate evapotranspiration with the, with the data from the EnviroNet Open Data Platform. So what I'm going to show you, it's the files that we created with the R Markdown format where we can follow this idea of literate program programming, where we can document all the steps with text. And also we can combine the text with the code and the results. So we are going to see at first the data dictionary. So what you will find over here is the selections that uh, I did in the EnviroNet Open Data Platform because this is an interface where you need to select um, the variables, the towers, and some other options that you want in order to download the data. It is going to download the data in a CSV uh, format, but uh, we have the, the, let's say that, we have to document these steps because if we want to re recreate this, we need to document uh, what were the selections that we did to download the data. So I downloaded um, uh, three data sets. One that is called Carbon Tower Data Streams. Uh, and we have the data dictionary over here. So you will see that it has the date time variable, sensible heat flux uh, variable, and so on and so forth. And you have the type of the variable, the missing values in that variable, and the unique variables. Uh, this data set uh, didn't work well, so we didn't use it, but we, we still documented this step on the data dictionary. So what you can see over here is like the distribution, the mean, the standard deviation from each of the variables grouped by variable type. For example, we have the numeric variables over here, the date time variables. And also we use the carbon tower data edic variance. And we have the selection of the variables over here and the same steps. Uh, a table with the name of the variable, the type and missing values and unique values. So you will see that for sensible heat flux, we have 7,420 missing values. And we have uh, like this quantity of unique values. And we have many variables over here. We didn't use them all. We just select the, the ones that we needed to calculate evapotranspiration, but this is the, the raw data, the whole data set. And now uh, we have over here also, uh, apart from of the data dictionary, grouped variables by the, the, the type. So we have all the numeric variables over here and some important information about the, the raw data from this data set from all the numeric variables. We also have the principal tower data edic variance. And with this, we ended up having an idea of the, the, the quantity and the quality of the data. So because we have many data points uh, from a date range that goes from 2013 to 2020, uh, we proceed to, to, to do the uh, exploratory data analysis. So we ended up with two data exploratory analysis. Why? This is because at, at first, when we took all the data, I start seeing some patterns and that we were missing data or data from some variables from the original data sets, from the principal 
Principal Tower Eddy and the Carbon Tower Eddy data, like for example, temperature. And so we needed to, to download data from, from other sensors. And we check all the patterns from evapotranspiration, uh, for example, the values from other uh, variables for all the date range available from those specific uh, data sets. So we try to check the, the, the behavior of water vapor mass density, for example, over the time, or latent heat flux that is important to calculate evapotranspiration. So with this exploratory data analysis, we had a better idea of the of all the patterns that we were finding in this uh, environmental monitoring site. And because we saw that there were no enough temperature data points, we needed to go back to the EnviroNet Open Data Platform to download data from other towers that do not measure uh, fluxes, but does have uh, temperature sensors. So in order to check all that temperature, uh, we leave everything documented over here in the exploratory data analysis for temperature and we have the meteorology station, we have uh, another tower, the, the Perros Tower, and we start matching all those temperature values with the date and time from the observations of fluxes from the carbon and principal tower. Uh, so we have all the analysis. These are all the data points. There are lots of data points available for temperature when you combine all the, the sensors. And they are in a, in a acceptable range of temperature for, for this site. And we also check if, if those data points were from just one sensor or what was the, the amount of data points per sensor for all the, the data points that we had available. So we can see some patterns over here that, for example, the, the, the Principe uh, uh, sensors, they have like a small uh, date range, but we have uh, some other sensors that are taking and measuring the temperature for, for, the, for the other dates. At the end, uh, oh, we also uh, check if we could use some, some other sensors like mean thermocouple, but we see that they reach a maximum of 26 uh, uh, degrees in Celsius. And so we didn't use these, these sensors for, for the site. So when we ended up with this knowledge that, okay, we have latent heat flux, we have temperature, and with that we can calculate evapotranspiration, we uh, start combining the data set, working on the data wrangling to join the, the data sets, the data sets to eliminating outliers and getting the data in a tidy format. After this, uh, combining the two towers, the carbon tower and the principal tower, we can see that we have an, an acceptable data range from uh, June 2013 to October 2019. And when we do the, the calculation of evapotranspiration, we have per observation, per data point, all these values. But we cannot see like a pattern. Remember that these all, every data point over here, it's a data point that was measured 
from 2013 to 2019 for each half time an hour. So we have a data point for eight in the morning, then another data point for 8.30 in the morning, then another data point for nine in the morning for all the days. So when we have that level of detail with all the data points, it is kind of hard to, to see a pattern of evapotranspiration through the time with this, with this visualization. So I talk with uh, Jürgen Nauer, who is the developer of the Big Leaf R package. And he said that one of the, the methods to, to see patterns over the time is to aggregate the data per date. It could be per day, per month, or per some season that you are interested. So what I did is to, uh, is to aggregate the data per day. Let me check that, yep, per day. And I obtained two, two values. The sum of the evapotranspiration per day and also the mean of evapotranspiration per day. So when we have the sum of evapotranspiration per day, we can see a, a better a pattern in, in the visualization compared with the first one, but it is still not enough. So with the mean of evapotranspiration per day, now we can see patterns and changes uh, per month. And we can detect also an increase for the end of 2016 and the start of 2017 that we think that is because there was the, uh, a storm in the, in the monitoring site and the, the rainy season was longer than, than the average of other years. So with this method, we can now see patterns. And the next steps is to study why we have those patterns over there. But up to this point, we have all the work to take the data from the EnviroNet Open Data Platform to clean the data, to wrangle and tidy the data, and to calculate evapotranspiration from this side. And everything is in code. So we can repeat this as many times as we want. And also if somebody wants to, to check the, the code and they want to use it, it is all published on, on, on the GitHub. So if you need to find this, this uh, all the code to, to recreate the visualizations and everything, you will find all the files over here. For example, the evapotranspiration calculation, and you can find all the steps that we follow to end up with the calculation of evapotranspiration. So, we were able to, to create the data dictionary, to do the exploratory data analysis, and to have the process uh, to calculate evapotranspiration in the, in the Santa Rosa National Park. Now, the next steps is to evaluate what these patterns of evapotranspiration are and also to create a data product that facilitates to use all, all this code in a more automatic way. And with this, I want to thank you. If you have any question, any commentary, or if you need help with, with some, something or a suggestion, you can send me an email or you can reach me through GitHub, my webpage or, or Twitter. Thanks.